Okay. So, um, all right. So I'm going to put quotes around the word statistics, and and uh, I'll, you'll see sort of what that means. So, um, you know, yesterday we talked about uh, you know differential privacy and uh, machine learning. Right, and we saw a number of interesting connections. Both we saw, you know, algorithms for uh, differentially private algorithms for machine learning problems, as well as some interesting ways in which d the guarantees of differential privacy might help us uh, execute various machine learning tasks, especially in an, ad in an adaptive setting. Okay, so the title of this talk is is differential privacy and statistics, um, and so you might, you know. The first, uh, first question you might ask is what the difference is between machine learning and statistics after all, to the extent they're really different. And in some sense, <coughs> in some sense they're really both the same, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're different aspects of the same question. You've got some uh, population or, or phenom phenomenon you, you want to study, usually uh, modeled as sort of a distribution. Uh, we'll call it P, okay, and uh, and then you have some data that is somehow data or observations right that in some some data that's somehow connected to this population i uh, you know often drawn like independently and identically distributed samples from the population, but not necessarily, so you know very crudely. Uh, you know, pr probability is, the, is the sort of the, the math that tells us what kind of data and observations we're likely to get given a given uh, distribution. And, uh, you know, statistics and machine learning and in sort of inference more generally is the process of reasoning about the population based on the observations we have. Uh, so, so this is the uh, you know this is the the process we're sort of most interested in today, and this is what we want to kind of play with and think about. Okay, so <coughs> uh, at this level, statistics and machine learning are really the same thing. They're both you know interested in this sort of basic picture, and they're trying to do this as efficiently as possible. Um, but machine learning came you know very crudely out of or sort of not crudely, but like at some very coarse, coarse level, the way to distinguish them is that uh, machine learning came out of um, computer science. And uh, maybe the, the thing that distinguishes machine learning from uh, statistics like culturally most strongly is really an emphasis on um, Goals that can be evaluated empirically. So empirically valuable goals. Okay, and by that I mean things like misclassification rates, prediction. So by, by and large, the focus of most work in machine learning is prediction. Okay, so this is a little bit of a cartoon that I'm presenting because, again, these are not, there are no hard and fast distinctions between the two fields and there's an enormous amount of overlap. But um, <clears throat> but if you sort of, l you know, go to a machine learning conference, by and large, the, the focus is on sort of uh, trying to accomplish tasks that, uh, where, where it's possible sort of after the fact to go and, you know, take a fresh data set and check how well you did. Okay. Um, and of course, there's a, a, a lar large, uh, a lot of emphasis on uh, large scale problems, be that sort of, uh, you know, lar large dimension or m more, uh, more significantly, l lots of data, just like large N, what statisticians would call large N. Okay, so in what I'll call statistics for the purpose of this talk, and, or rather to, and, and this is really just a contrast with, with the kinds of things we were talking about yesterday, um, we're sort of interested in, um, not, not just sort of prediction tasks, not just being able to uh, 
decide, um, for example, you know, who, who's going to be a, a good, you know, what advertisement I should show a given um, browser to, on my website or things like that, but also um, sort of more interpretive tasks. Uh, and, and that's going to, sort of interpretation generally is going to play a big role in, it plays a big role in sort of statistics as, you know, quote, statisticians see it. Um, <coughs> and uh, and then all, the other thing is sort of, again, for sort of cultural reasons, because uh, statistics sort of historically has been, has interfaced with sort of all fields of science and not just, you know, the internet. Um, uh, they, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on, on, on looking at settings where data are expensive to collect and where you get, have very little data and you're really trying to extract as much as you possibly can out of, say, a data set of size, you know, 100. Like, you go out and you do 100 interviews with uh, people in, in, you know, in the field. Some sociologist goes out and un interviews 100 people and now wants to draw conclusions about the population based on this tiny sample. And, and so... <coughs> Um, this sort of, this shift towards, ex you know, expensive data and, and small data sets um, mean, brings about like a vi sort of a very different focus, right? So, for example, um, you know, well, exact constants matter uh, much more so than in a setting where, uh, where you, you've got so much data that, you, you know, you, you have more data than you sort of really need to solve the problem, but you, you know, you try and use the data to help you solve it quickly. Um, and, um, and also the, uh, an emphasis on, on sort of evaluating how confident you are about decisions you're going to make uh, very, very carefully. Because you're in a regime where the, the decisions you're going to make are not very clear, and so you you know the, you might you know be only able to make predictions with, or or make assertions with say you know confidence in the range of say like seventy percent or eighty percent and then there's a big difference between you know being able to assert something is you know with, with confidence closer to seventy percent or you know eighty five percent right okay so again this is sort of a, a you know a, a cartoon, this is not, not re, you know, th th there's really a, a huge amount of emphasis here, uh, of overlap here. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe a further disclaimer, which is, uh, you know, if, if, I don't know how to say this, uh, I am not a statistician. <laughs> so maybe the last disclaimer is that it's sort of, Excuse me. Um, I'm not a statistician, so sort of like any resemblance to statisticians, real or implied, is entirely fictional. And, uh, you know, your, your mileage may vary. And, like, if you really want to know what statisticians do, go talk to an actual statistician and ask them. All right. Okay, so that's... <coughs> um, that's, that's just sort of a, a quick picture. So, like, a, you know, a typical task in statistics, if you were looking at, say, a regression problem, Sorry, a typical task uh, might be, for example, solving a regression problem. And um, <coughs> whereas in machine learning, we, we'd just be in interested in some notion of uh, excuse me. We in in machine learning, we'd just be you know, interested in minimizing some notion of loss, so some notion of prediction accuracy, okay? Whereas in, in sort of this cartoon version of statistics, we're going to be more interested in other types of things. We're going to be interested, for example, in, you know, which variables, uh, which, which of the sort of feature variables that I'm basing reg my regression on are significant, Yeah, that's what happens when you speak truth to power. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, right. Just, just, just never. We'll fix it later. Yeah, whatever. Oh, oh yeah, whatever. Okay, yeah. yeah. I'm sure you're recording it on your iPad. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, we're good. All right. <clears throat> so, sorry about that. Okay, so we, we might be asking questions like which variables are significant or, um, <coughs> or for example, of, or like, you know, sort of related to that, how large is a particular effect? So, for example, if there's an effect on uh, <coughs> excuse me, of an effect on, of, um, you know, quality of early childhood education on, you know, <coughs> your eventual success in, 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 at university, uh, you know, how strong is that effect, which direction does it go in, that kind of question, and even more subtle questions like uh, causal, causal que you know, questions about causal relationships, uh, like, you know, does A cause B, for example. Okay, and this is again like a question, a kind of thing that uh, statisticians will be interested in, that <coughs> if you're sort of, if you show up at a typical talk at, at a machine learning conference, uh, you know, they don't really care whether or not the, fe the variables they're selecting out of their data cause in any real sense uh, people to click on their ads, they just, they just want to know whether people are going to click on the ads. Right? <clears throat> Whereas if we're interested in, say, you know, making changes to an education system, then we really need to understand like, much more subtle types of, uh, of <clears throat> relationships between in the, in the underlying process that's generating the data. Okay, so... <clears throat> uh, so so this, this sort of difference in philosophy leads to very different types of things that people try to... Uh, do with their data, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll talk about a few sort of topics. I'll talk about uh, hypothesis testing a little bit. I'll talk about confidence intervals, construction of confidence intervals. So these are both tools that, <coughs> uh, so this is sort of, you know, today. Uh, these are both tools that, that, that are used to assess like how confident we are in one sense or another about some conclusion we want to draw. And uh, I'll also talk uh, a little bit more technically about sort of uh, asymptotic distributions and, um, and some of the sort of more technical questions that come out of this. And I apologize that these three, there's, there's like a type mismatch between the first two bullets and the, the third one. So like, you know, John is probably wincing, but you know, okay, deal. All right. So, <coughs> so let's talk a little bit about hypothesis testing. So uh, this is something that we can... Uh, uh, that is sort of like a, a very basic question in, in statistics and, of course, in machine learning, too. So imagine that we have two sets of distributions. And uh, we'll call them hypotheses. So each of these, e each of these two hypotheses is uh, a collection of distributions. So for example, the, the first hypothesis, hypothesis might be a world in which um, two variables, A and B, are independent. So these would be sort of distributions under which two, two particular uh, random variables are independent. And this might be, uh, these might be the distributions under which the uh, you know, correlation between A and B is uh, at least, uh, I don't know, 0 0.5 or something like that. Okay, so, <coughs> so we've got two, collect two sets of distributions, and uh, the question is, uh, roughly speaking, you know, assuming uh, our true distribution P comes from one of these two sets, 
the question is to determine which one it comes from. So, uh, you know, computer scientists who, who like, if you, if you sort of grew up in computer science, you'll recognize this as a classic promise problem. So you're given sort of some guarantee about the set, or some, you're making some assumption about the worlds you might live in, either that the, these things are independent or these things are, are, are correlated, and you're trying to, significantly correlated, and you're trying to sort of distinguish which of these two worlds you're in. And of course, there's, a, there's an art to sort of formulating uh, hypo you know, formulating which of these two hypotheses, these two hypotheses, like formulating the two hypotheses you want to use, and we're not going to get into that. Um, <coughs> but given a, given a pair of hypotheses like this, you might ask, um, so given H0 and H1 and N, what is the best differentially private algorithm for solving this, uh, for solving this problem, for determining, you know, which of these two worlds you come from. Okay, and, and by best, you d I just mean like your, where your probability of making a mistake and making the wrong, drawing the wrong conclusion is as low as possible. Let's say the sum of the probabilities or the average of the probabilities over these two uh, hypotheses. Okay. Um, what you're really getting with, when, when you're sort of given an algorithm, what you're really getting is some sort of trade-off between um, two, two types of error probabilities. So, so given it for a particular algorithm, what, you, what you've really got is some sort of trade-off where here you've got a probability of a false positive on one axis and a probability of a false negative, let's say, on the other axis. So that's like, one of these axes is deciding you're in H1 when your distribution really came from H0, and the other axis is the other way around. And so what we really want to understand is sort of the best possible trade-off between these two, these, these things. Okay, so... <coughs> um, people have, have sort of looked at these questions, but I'll, I'll confess that when when people st started doing research, you know, in, on differential privacy, and, you know, by people, I mean, like, you know, some of the people in this room, we kind of viewed this question as sort of a not significantly different from, like, being basically being answered by uh, the kinds of things, um, by the kinds of tools that, like, noise addition, for example, that we were, we were thinking about, right? So, for example, if you had... <coughs> Let's take uh, a, a case with two binary vi variables. So suppose, you know, here's A and here's B, and A can be either yes or no, and B can be either yes or no. And let, let's say we want to know if A and B are independent. Okay, so we could go out and collect a data set, and it would have, um, after we collect the data set, we could sort of construct a, like a little histogram for this these two variables and from this can decide whether or not, uh, try to decide whether or not um, A and B are independent and, and this is sort of a well, well understood problem in statistics. There's tons of work on, on what the best sort of rule to, to use is here to decide if these two things are independent but roughly speaking you're, you're going to look at how, how far this uh, table is from the, the nearest table um, of the form that would come up uh, sort of in, in a perfect world if they were exactly independent where, where these, these four numbers have the form uh, like n times, you know, p times q, n times p times 1 minus q, you know, n times uh, 1 minus p times q, and n times 1 minus p times 1 minus q, right? So you'd sort of try to see how far is the table I've observed from the nearest table of this form and um, <coughs> of the second form and, and, uh, and, you know, draw some conclusion based on that. Okay. But um, now let's look at what happens with differential privacy. With differential privacy, we're going to sort of, one, one way to, to release this table is to add Laplace noise, and that, that'll work pretty well. You'll get a, re a, a closely related table where uh, each of these, 
counts is off by about one over epsilon from its true, uh, from its value in the original data set. Okay? And so you might, uh, <coughs> the sort of, so we go and we, you know, we argue via like tail bounds on the Laplace distribution that these two tables are, are close. And so anything you do with the second table, you should be able to do with the first table. Uh, anything you can do with the first table, uh, with the original table, you should be able to do with the noisy table and get basically the same resu results. Okay? Uh, <coughs> and uh, and, and the, you know, the problem is, of course, in the word basically. Right? So uh, asymptotically, these, these have the same distribution. But, uh, you know, they're not exactly the same distribution. And indeed, if you sort of try to uh, use the, um, if you try to use the, the, the tests that people use on the, would use on the non-private data, if you try to use that on the noisy data, you're actually going to draw, like, actually incorrect conclusions, right? So, for example, you might, <coughs> uh, you, you might get a picture like this. So, if for example, uh, this was this exact question was looked at by, you know, Lee Lee and Kiefer and uh, um, uh, Gaboardi, uh, Karwa and um, Rogers and Vedan, and uh, <coughs> and so they looked at at exactly this type of question where they were trying to sort of figure out well you know, how bad would it be if you try to use this, if you try to use the noisy table as you would use the um, true table? And it's it sort of asymptotically, the answer is it wouldn't be bad at all. It would be identical. But actually, even when n is sort of pretty large, like in the thousands, there's actually like a big difference between under uh, what the, the types of conclusions you would draw under the two settings. So, so for example, you know, I'm re reproducing a, a plot approximately, but you might get um, an inflation of uh, a factor of sort of two in, in a probability, in, in probabilities of, of certain tests telling you that the variables are, two variables are independent or, or not. Um, and, uh, and, and that would be like, you know, you'd, you'd sort of, that's, that's like a real problem, right? So if you want, if you're in a regime where you, where these things are, either, you know, exactly independent or not very strongly correlated, then you really need to be able to understand much more precisely what's going on, and you'll actually sort of draw incorrect conclusions uh, based on the noisy data. And that's, that's you know, roughly speaking, because adding noise will weaken the correlation between the random variables, and if you don't take that into account in your test, you're going to have a problem. So, <coughs> so in fact, these, these papers and also... Um, a recent paper of Rogers and Kiefer, so these papers are all like on the archive, uh, will give, uh, sort of look at how you adjust, how we, you would adjust uh, a, a prob um, how you would adjust the, uh, the hypothesis test that you're gonna do to take into account uh, these, this extra noise and, and to sort of take into account not, not the distribution you, you have in the non-private setting, but the actual noisy distribution. Okay. And it turns out that this is, a, you know, this is not always a trivial thing to do. Generally, it's not, with, with tests like this, it's not super hard. But as the, um, as the algorithms that we use become more and more sophisticated, if we use, for example, these algorithms for private multiplicative weights or uh, some of these algorithms for optimization that I was talking about yesterday, then we don't really have a good handle on how to think about these questions. Okay. So we have these various asymptotic bounds that tell us how well we do, and of course things like you know, prediction ability we can measure empirically, so it's much easier for us to get a handle on to the extent to which we're messing up. But uh, these, these sort of more subtle questions about you know, confidence, how, how confidently we can infer a certain, draw a certain conclusion, um, I would say that as, like, as a community we don't have a good handle on how to think about these questions when we're using differentially private algorithms. Um, <coughs> just to give you a, like a, you know, so in this particular case, it turns out there's something relatively simple you can do. So if you add Laplace noise to all of the counts, um, you know, the, w the, you can basically apply the, um, so in this particular case, right, 
Um, you can basically apply the non-private test uh, to a projected a projected table. So uh, where you've um, so you're going to project to the nearest table where the sum of the entries is exactly n. Okay. So that's you, you know that's the first thing you'll do is so the the first thing is to reduce the amount of noise you're dealing with by taking into account the fact that you know the original table has entries that sum to n and now you're you're actually what you're um, you, you, so even though you get a noisy version where, which may change the sum of the entries in the table, you can sort of basically push yourself back into the, um, the linear subspace of, or the, the polytope of tables that, uh, that have non-zero entries and, and sum to n. Uh, but then you still, even then you still have to adjust, uh, so you also have to uh, adjust the thresholds you use for, various, for d making a decision at a given le level of confidence. And uh, <coughs> you basically, the, the, the way you do this is by some kind of explicit sampling. So you can try to, you can try to calculate various probabilities, um, like v various asymptotic distributions analytically, but, but like the, the most reliable way to do this and the easiest way in this setting is via some sort of just empirical evaluation of uh, you know, if these things were really independent, what would the probability be of me, get, me seeing a particular uh, value of this test statistic I want to compute? Yeah. Uh, so does this uh, technique limited to the definition of the sexual privacy of all these swap Yeah, so, so uh, basically depending on the notion of differential privacy, you well, depending on what other information you have, you would, you know, use that information differently. So if you don't know n, if n is not a public piece of information, then you can't do that. And then you would do something, then you would, uh, you basically wouldn't do this projection step, but you'd still have to do this um, extra piece where you sort of factor in uh, the additional noise, you know, you still have to adjust your thresholds. And in this particular case, like, just, Doing that computationally is pretty simple. It's not, you know, super hard. Um, <coughs> but the, the, yeah, like I said, sort of for more complex algorithms, it's not, not quite a, as obvious what to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so if, if you've got like so much data that the noise doesn't matter, then you don't have to do anything special. Because it's asymptotically the same. But the, I guess the point is that even with a table of like four entries, the asymptotics don't kick in until you're in, and like with epsilon equals say you know, 0 0.1, the asymptotics don't really kick in until uh, you're like in the like, you know, n equals 5,000 range, right? And, and like, yeah, you know, of course, if you say, like, you know, you talk to someone who works at Google and you say, like, is n greater than 5,000, they'll, like, laugh you out of the room, right? But, like, if you talk to a sociologist and this is their, like, you know, wet dream is to have, like, that much data about these phenomena, they're, you know, they're dealing with, like, n equals 30, right? So, um, now, of course, with, with really tiny samples, you're not going to be do able to do anything really meaningful differentially privately. If you've got, like, 10 people, good luck. Um, but if you've got, you know, in the low hundreds, these adjustments actually make a huge difference. And actually, the, the really, the key piece is that, like, it's okay if you conclude you don't have enough d data to make a firm decision. It is not okay to make the wrong decision with false confidence, falsely high confidence. And actually, um... Which never happens in statistics around elections, for example. Right. <laughs> right. So, yeah, this... This, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, that's not even funny. <laughs> so, uh, um, <coughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, one, one actually, you know, the, the, 
the model inversion paper that uh, Vitaly uh, talked about yesterday. Um, <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, right. <laughs> yes. So um, the model inversion paper that uh, that Vitaly talked about yesterday, which like is a, a great punching bag for lots of reasons, has has like one at least one sort of reasonably charitable interpretation, which is that. Uh, one of the things they point out in this paper is that if you use differentially private algorithms for, say, in a medical context, without taking into, the fa into, the, into account the fact that what you're getting is like a noisy outcome and not, not the same thing you would get with the non-private data, then uh, you will very, very confidently make very wrong decisions. Right, that's when the toe tags come out. Yeah, okay. So... Um, <coughs> So one, one sort of general approach that I think is, is sort of underused in the differential privacy literature but, but has been used successfully in, an, in a few papers is this sort of Be Bayesian approach. And I think, um, I, th I think it's sort of like one of the things I want to do in this talk is, is encourage more thinking in our community about like this, this sort of, you know, quote Bayesian, using this sort of Bayesian approach to make use of the algorithms we have. So the idea is that you um, assume some uh, prior distribution. It's called like a hyper distribution. On the, on P. So rather, so now rather than having like uh, a single distribution that's an, a single unknown distribution that's generating the data, we have sort of a um, hyper distribution, let's call that Q. So we've got a distribution Q, it's going to generate, you know, a distribution P according to uh, Q. So here, let me use different, um, different notation. So P is like itself sampled from a distribution Q on parameters. So for example, a simple example would be like Q would be a distribution on zero one, and now P is is uh, a number in is a single number between zero and one, and then from P we generate, you know, data x one up to x n, where this is um, uh, you know n iid uh, coin flips Bernoulli random variables with parameter uh, P. Okay, so then, and then this is what the algorithm gets. And you, you know, go from there. Okay, and so the, the sort of, uh, the Bayesian approach is to look at, <coughs> so you've got this ad ad additional distribution Q, and now you can, but now you can look at what's the probability that uh, the, the sort of underlying distribution P takes a particular value given the observed data, given the observations you have. And uh, the point is that this is, this is something we can actually so, sort of compute. This is exactly uh, the probability that A of X would be equal to this particular output uh, if P were equal to you know, a particular outcome. Um, little P, little, how do I get rid of this? All right, uh, there we go, okay. Uh, <coughs> times, uh, right, some, times some correction factor where the first factor is sort of um, the probability we would see P over the, um, of the probability that we would see this outcome not for a particular p, but over all possible p, so summed over all possible p. So this is just Bayes' rule. And now the, the point is that, um, <clears throat> you know, as, uh, as analysts, we can, be, because we, do work, we have some control over the algorithm that's processing the data, this, this quantity we know how to compute. Uh, similarly, we know how to compute sort of each of these terms in this, in this, uh, in this ra uh, ratio. And so, uh, <coughs> and so what we can do is we can actually sort of go and update our view of, uh, of the probability that, um, 
the, the, dis the data was drawn from a particular distribution given the observed information. Okay. And again, so here the, the observed information is uh, the, the outcome of the algorithm and now we're making some assumption about the distribution on P, but the sort of interesting, one of the interesting things is that like the exact assumption we make about how P was generated doesn't really affect too strongly the conclusions we get for most settings. Okay, and so the, the advantage of doing things this way is that you get, um, rather than getting like an estimate of say the parameters of P, what we get is actually sort of a distribution on P of likely values for P and that will kind of automatically incorporate all the uncertainty that was introduced by um, this extra randomness. Okay. The, the problem with this approach is that it, it's computationally quite difficult uh, because essentially because we need to compute this denominator term which is like an integral over all or a sum over all possible probability distributions of the probability that uh, you, you would get this particular outcome under that distribution. Um, but assuming that you can actually do this, this sort of computational, computational piece reasonably effectively, then uh, you, this sort of allows us to, to kind of automatically incor incorporate this additional uncertainty and not make, you know, quite so silly decisions. And in particular, like for example, in that, you know, model inversion paper that I was talking about, if they'd sort of thought about the problem this way, there, there, wouldn't have been a, there wouldn't have been a problem. They would have just seen that they had a very weak signal, very low confidence about the conclusion, and they would have just stopped there. Um, <coughs> so th this approach requires sort of fairly heavy computational tools in high dimensional settings. Um, and it's also one where sort of it's, it's sort of hard to, prove ni hard to prove nice theorems, right? So basically it's something that requires uh, like you don't, you don't have like nice, generally, you don't generally have nice closed form solutions for what this conditional distribution looks like. Sometimes you do, but not, not usually. And so uh, it's something that theoreticians kind of are allergic to because, because it's sort of uh, not something that's, that's well suited to the tools we have, but I think it's a sort of an important approach and, and uh, it's been explicitly looked into by a number of researchers. And if this is uh, the thing, kind of thing you like, I can, I can give you citations offline. Okay, so <clears throat> one other thing I wanted to mention about the, the connection to, about hypothesis testing is a connection between differential privacy and adaptive hypothesis testing. Excuse me, so um, this com comes back to the sort of the kind of thing that Kobe was talking about yesterday where suppose you've got a data set, you run some algorithm on it to get some output and you're, the, you're like a human being on the outside of the system that's gonna, based on this first output, say, um, okay, you know, based on A, I wanna do some particular hypothesis test Uh, you know, I want to test the, like, you know, for some particular pair of hypotheses, H0, H1. And, <coughs> um, excuse me. And so we might ask, well, okay, so then, you know, you go back to the, the natural thing is to just sort of, uh, you know, then go back to the data. So you'd sort of pick your favorite test, call it T. And, um, and then run that test on the same data set. Okay, and uh, in the normal, uh, so, so this, this is not the usual setting in which hypothesis testing is analyzed. Normally when you analyze a hypothesis test, you assume that first you choose the hypothesis test, then you go and get the data, and then you actually run the test. But like in this setting, what's happening is the actual choice of the test uh, depends on, uh, it depends on X and it depends on X via this first algorithm, A1, okay? And so you can't, uh, it turns out that like, even if your test was sort of very nicely calibrated and you'd done all this work that I said you had to do, uh, 
you may get like completely skewed results in this type of setting and that this has nothing to do with privacy. It has to do with the fact that there's this like extra dependency between the choice of the test and the data set. Um, and, and just as, as, with came up, as, as came up in, in Kobe's talk yesterday where if I choose a hypothesis based on a differentially private algorithm, I can con say something about how different the um, outcome of the, the average of that uh, function is over the data and over the underlying distribution. So here we can say that uh, if A is differentially private, then the probability that T accepts on the data set X, so this is T, I'm gonna call it T sub X to make it clear that it's actually dependent on the data, is sort of at some crude level uh, <coughs> related to the probability that T ex would accept on a fresh sample. And, uh, <coughs> and, and the, the, the point is that without some restriction on this algorithm A1, uh, you can't actually make any statement of this form. And in fact, you can, get, you can sort of get basically like arbitrarily bad dependencies, uh, even in very natural settings. And whereas with differential privacy, what you're gonna get is something like, well, the, the probability of um, the probability with which your test will accept will be uh, inflated by, you know, some not very small factor, but a factor which is not nevertheless bounded, which is on the order of like two to the epsilon squared n. Okay, so it doesn't really matter what that exact factor is. It can be a large number, but the point is that you can actually compute it and you can put a bound on it and it's finite. And so that, what that means is that uh, if you can... If you understand this quantity, which is the thing that you, you would normally reason about when thinking about a hypothesis test, then you can get a handle on this quantity, the thing you, can, you get uh, when you're, you're sort of doing your test adaptively. And uh, I'm unaware of sort of any other uh, non-trivial result of this form. Like there, there's almost, there, there there are a couple of under other conditions under which you can make statements like that, but they basically boil down to uh, the output of the first algorithm being compressible to say like k bits or something like that. Some, some very, very re uh, heavy restriction on, on the algorithm A. So this is an interesting connection, I think, and one that uh, you know, should be investigated further. Uh, but, but this uses, the uses many of the same tools uh, as in Kobe's talk. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. So this is uh, um, Rogers, uh, Roth, Smith, and Tucker. Okay. Um, so, so let me just sort of conclude this section on hypothesis testing with a, an open question, which is, sort of more, uh, you know, m maybe the first like really precise technical statement I'll even make today, which is, uh, suppose we've got the following very simple type of hypothesis testing, hypothesis test, where um, each of the hypotheses we want to test is a singleton. So basically we know the distribution, we, or we assume the data was distributed either according to distribution P or according to distribution Q, okay, with two, just two very specific distributions. Um, so non-privately, and we'll get, uh, uh, well, yeah, sure, okay. Non-privately, there, there is a best test, okay? There is like a single uh, best test, which is sort of obvious in retrospect once you sort of write it down, which is what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the probability given X, 
I'm going to look at the probability that I would have gotten x under p over the probability I would have gotten x under q, and I'll compare this to uh, some threshold. You know, we'll call it like tau. And uh, the best test will always have this form. Okay, so it, of course the, the value of tau can change, and the, basically the value of tau depends on how you want to trade off false, false negatives versus false positives, but like a, a reasonable value of tau is like one, right? Um, so under uh, what, what, what we don't know, except in like, a, like really, really sim simple settings, like when the, the data is actually binary, is how to characterize what does the best test look like um, when, uh, when we're, we're d using differential privacy and we have a choice of which differentially private algorithm to run. Okay. So can we, char like, can we characterize the form of the best uh, differentially private hypothesis test? Okay. So this, this we don't have a good handle on. You can write, you can try to like, you can try to think, if you try to think about it for a while, what you realize that the issue is like, if I, if I were to specify the differentially private algorithm, then I'd know what the best test looks like. It'll look like some ra you know, ratio of probabilities like we have here. But the, the thing is I have freedom to, choose, to actually choose the differentially private algorithm. And once I do that, it's totally unclear uh, how I should choose it or what it should look like. So that's sort of one open question. And, and sort of more generally, we can formulate you know, some... some question of, of the following form, given, you know, given hypotheses uh, H0 and H1 and a param you know, par privacy parameters N and delta, um, what is the, you know, the minimal, the m minimum, uh, the, what is the minimal, you know, minimum N such that you know there exists a, an epsilon delta differentially private algorithm uh, that um, does this hypothesis test executes this hypothesis test with uh, false positive decision, probability of a false positive and probability of false negative, both less than, let's say, you know, some given threshold, like one third. Okay, so what is the sample size we need to be able to distinguish two given hypotheses differentially privately? And this is, a, again, you know, a quantity that we don't really understand. Basically, the best thing we can say about this is that it's at least, uh, as, least as high as the non-private value. So... You know, so what, what's the non, what would the non-private value be? It would somehow be like with infinite parameters, epsilon and delta. And what we know is that it's not, it's not much bigger than order of log one over delta over epsilon times, uh, <laughs> sorry, I, we, we can probably get rid of the log one over delta, but. So what we know, uh, <coughs> what you can argue is that is the following statement that uh, the, the 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 sample size required of the best hypothesis test is you know at least what is required of the best non-private hypothesis test. That's sort of a, a vacuous statement, uh, but <coughs> not vacuous, but but like you know straight obvious statement. But um, what we know is that the, the optimal sample size doesn't get blown up by more than a factor of about one over epsilon. Okay, which is like, you know, not bad necessarily. But, uh, <coughs> but if you sort of go to a sociologist and say, don't worry, you won't require more than, you know, for epsilon equals 0 0.1, we're not going to need more than like, you know, 15 times as much data. You know, your study won't cost more than 15 times as much as like you thought it would, right? They will say, like, 
Okay, don't worry, <laughs> we won't use differential privacy, right? So, <laughs> so uh, understanding this sort of, these types of relationships more precisely, I think, is an interesting open question, um, both sort of at the theoretical level, like, as, you know, how do, these, how do these numbers relate in some, you know, in sort of full generality, but also, as I said, it, like, it, for very specific concrete problems. The best hypothesis test? Yeah. Um, what the, what the uh, so coming, well, uh, let me just, yeah, you're coming back here. You know, for these types of settings, we can say various, um, make, excuse me, make various statements. They are, it's some sort of weird function that, you know, the ratio of these two sample sizes tends to one as the, um, Confidence, if you want to have really, really high confidence, which sort of corresponds to having lots of data. And, uh, and then it, it sort of at the other end of the extreme, it, 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 when you have a very low confidence range, um, you get, like, roughly speaking, a constant blow up in the, in the like, amount of data. And that's, but that's like the really low confidence range where, where like, the, s the sum of the entries in this table is, is going to be, you know, less than 100 or like, you know, in the 50s range. So the, the point is that like non-privately for these very simple questions, you actually don't need a lot of data to answer them. With if you want to have confidence sort of like 80%, if you want to be right only 80% of the time, you actually really don't need a lot of data. A very small amount of data suffices. But then to get that same confidence with differential privacy, you need a significantly larger amount of data. You can argue, of course, that like confidence 80% is not that interesting. We, we really want to be in the like 99% confidence range, but you know sometimes, yeah, you do what you can with the data you have. All right. <coughs> for the non-private setting, in in like for that particular test of independence, there are. There are very tight characterizations of how much data. <coughs> um, it's going to depend on the two hypotheses. So y yes, I mean in general, yes. For the specific case where uh, H, you know, um, sorry, I'm pointing on my screen as if you can see. For the <laughs> the specific case where uh, <coughs> you're you're testing you know, two singleton hypotheses where you just like either, it's either distribution P or distribution Q, then uh, because we know what the best test actually looks like, we can just sort of evaluate how well it does very specifically. Either, either computational, either like empirically or, or in theory, right? So, uh, but in general, no, in general, even non-privately, non if, you, if you allow like more complicated hypotheses, then we don't have like a, clean characterization. It's like it's too, uh, at that point it just becomes too general a question to write down like a really simple characterization because there's sort of too much going on. But for very specific families, like testing, you know, are these two variables independent versus not, there we have, you know, there there's a pretty good understanding of what the optimal test looks like. Yeah, it's just using sample and aggregate. In fact, now that I think about it, so, yeah, there's no delta, right? Sorry, sorry, there's no. Right, it turns out, you don't, yeah, you don't need the dependency on delta, you just need epsilon, and, and the, the constant in the big O is not very big, but um, it, nor, nor is it one. It's like, you know, five or 10 or something. Okay. Excuse me. All right. So, <coughs> so w one can ask similar questions. I'll, 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 I won't speak for long about this, about confidence intervals. So in, in, con in the case of confidence intervals, uh, <coughs> it's sort of a, a related question where you've got, um, you know, again, you've got this setup where P generates some data, which goes through an algorithm, and you see the output. And <coughs> you're trying to make, uh, you're, you're based on, on the output A, you're trying to make statements about some function of P. So what, what you, the kind of statements you really want to make are like some, you know, 
some function of p, like maybe the, the mean of the distribution is between uh, two, two, you know, between two numbers. Okay, so you're trying to find numbers A and B that, like, with, that you're reasonably confident capture this thing you're interested in, like, let's say, the mean of the distribution or the variance of the distribution. And there, <coughs> again, so again, there, there's this question of, like, how do you make those confident, how do you make that interval as tight as possible? And um, here, the, the kind of results that are proven in, in most papers apply more directly, because very often the results are of the form uh, you know, your output will be, be within, you know, 1 over epsilon n of the mean or something like that with high probability. Um, but it turns out that, uh, you know, getting these sort of, uh, using the results from the, uh, using the results from papers directly here d isn't very useful. generally leads to very wide intervals. And uh, so you can do this. I mean, it, like it, it makes sense to just uh, take the theorems from the papers and plug them into this setting directly. But, uh, but you tend to get like these, these vast overestimates of the, the, like the width of this confidence interval. And, um, and actually, when you, when you sit down to try and write down like the best the tightest confidence interval you can come up with for a given algorithm, that's sort of reasonably straightforward, but trying to find like the best algorithm to give you... Uh, oh, sorry, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so, so let me state an open question. So, so you know, the best... Um, finding the best confidence interval based on sort of where you have freedom to choose the differentially private algorithm, or I should say not based on, but via uh, differentially private algorithm, uh, is uh, that's sort of in general open for many questions. And just like even a very specific one that uh, is still open, so this was sort of formulated by uh, Vishesh Karwa and Salil Vadan, um, and I, I, I remember being very surprised that it wasn't, uh, like, that it wasn't a trivially answered by the tools we have, but it's sort of not obviously. So is that if I have, um, you know, suppose that my data are, are drawn just like a really simple model. So they're drawn independently from a normal distribution with mean mu and, and uh, standard deviation one, but where I don't know mu. Uh, you know, find the best algorithm to estimate mu, to place confidence uh, intervals on mu. And, um, so, What we'd want is something with uh, confidence intervals with width roughly um, 1 over epsilon times n, uh, or, uh, and, and where the, the sort of the, the constant 1 here will depend on, on like exactly what assumption we make about the standard deviation, so there's some like direct connection between those. Um, but the uh, sort of getting this best possible uh, width is um, sort of not known. Okay, getting something that is, uh, that doesn't depend on the, um, sorry, let me, let me change this a little bit. Okay, so the, the sort of, if you think about this problem for a few minutes and you've sort of seen, you know, given the material we've seen in, this, in these lectures, uh, 
the natural conjecture would be that you can get uh, <coughs> a confidence interval of width about you know, 1 over square root of n. And that comes from the fact that you've, there's some inherent uncertainty when you do your sampling, like x is not you know, the actual distribution, it's just the data, uh, plus some additional uncertainty that t comes from the, um, uh, the, differential, the constraints of differential privacy. And we don't know how to get exactly, and, and you want like the optimal constants, um, you know, on top of these two terms. And uh, we don't know how to get that um, in full, uh, sort of for this problem in general. We, we, there are extra terms that come in. And uh, I'm not going to state the exact best known bound because I think it's sort of, that. first of all, their paper is not like the final version of their paper isn't even on online yet. Uh, so I don't even know what the exact result is, and maybe it's in flux, but just to give you a flavor of like what kind of thing, you know, how basic a question we don't know how to answer, this is an example. Okay. So I'll, uh, I, I'm going to run over time by like, you know, one more minute just to, to mention that, um, so, so I've been sort of emphasizing so far all these questions about like constants and getting exact, exact tests and things like that. Uh, so, uh, you know, given all this, we might ask, uh, you know, for the kinds of questions we've been discussing, do, you know, do asymptotics matter at all? And the answer, of course, is yes. Well, there's still lots of interesting questions that we want to understand of an asymptotic nature because we do want to understand what happens when, you know, as we get more data, as we get um, uh, more, you know, as the problem as the problem features change, uh, what happens? But uh, I guess the the sort of types of question. If you think like, what are the types of results I need to prove to 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 help people do hypothesis testing and things like that? We want um, what we want is not just accuracy bounds. but sort of an understanding of the form of the distribution, the distribution of A of X given um, given particular distribution, input distributions P. And so uh, it turns out there's sort of like a lot of l literature in statistics on sort of understanding how to, what is sort of the asymptotic distribution. Do you get like, you know, asymptotically, do you get a normal distribution? Do you get a chi-square distribution? Stuff like that. And uh, sort of privately, again, we have um, various questions of the form, you know, can we get estimators with the right asymptotic, you know, can we get estimators with the right asymptotic distribution? Can we get differentially private estimators? And uh, again, you know, we have, there are some results along these lines. Uh, in, for ex the, the one I know that was sort of that I guess I'm most uh, you know closest to is you know my own my own work there are, there are a few other results along these lines but uh, we I would say by and large we don't have a good understanding of how closely we can sort of imitate the asymptotics of the non-private setting subject to differential privacy and this is especially um, so I think it's especially interesting in cases where we know we can't imitate the asymptotics of the the, um, the non-private setting and the question then is like well how, how good can we get them to to look how nice can we get them to look especially for mo more complex uh, algorithms okay so especially for uh, let's say private multiplicative weights and other complex differentially private algorithms what kinds of asymptotic statement distributional statements can we make 
Okay, so in, in this paper I, I've cited, I handled a sort of a much simpler setting where you didn't need the machinery of, say, private, private multiple code of weights and things like that, uh, and you could get away with, uh, with something a little simpler, but, uh, but I think it's, it's still an interesting question and one that, you know, if we can answer it sort of clearly, I think it'll give us insight also into these, these questions that I was mentioning earlier, like concrete parameters and exact constants and things like that. Okay, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'll take questions if you if you have any maybe offline during the break. Thanks. <laughs>